On this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we're going to talk about what's hot and what's not with Microsoft's latest Surface devices. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the latest episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. Our fearless leader, Dave, is hunkered down in the bunker doing work. So Chris and I are going to handle today's stream. And we have plenty of stuff to talk about. Microsoft uh, had a their latest Surface event today and launched a whole wave of new products. Surface Pro, Surface Laptop Studio, a new Surface Duo, an updated Surface Pro X. They even snuck in an updated Surface 7 Plus that not many people have talked about. Bunch of accessories, whole bunch of stuff to talk about. But before we get to all of that good stuff, Chris, how you doing, buddy? I am hanging in there, trying not to, you know, strangle a certain large um, hardware retailer for posting a payment they shouldn't have but you know that's neither here nor there call them out call them out publicly Uh, use the power of the press yeah (laughs) if you if you ever use lowe's auto payment system just don't it's it's a nightmare this isn't the first issue i've had but this time they decided to charge the entire balance of my account instead of the zero percent little chunk i had set up so their support's not very helpful i've been through a number of service reps and i think i'll maybe have it resolved in a week but yeah Gotcha, gotcha. That's little nice, little spicy you know, over that. It's always fun when you're hit with an unexpected big payment for something. We have to say hello to Paw Diddy Sweezy. He is already in the chat. What's going on, brother? Good to see you. Glad that hey, you're Paw here. Diddy. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. But so yeah, I man. Um, and how are you? Exciting going. I, you know, I'm okay. It's been a, a stressful few weeks. There's lots of stuff going on in the background at Hot Hardware that we have to work out. Lots of stuff going on in the personal life that have to work out. I'm so behind on work. It's not even funny. I hate this feeling. Um, but I have been fairly productive the last few days. Closed up a big project. I have a review going live tomorrow. Uh, hopefully shooting a video this weekend to get some more content up on the channel. It's going to be a a wee little um thread ripper pro build so it should be pretty Ooh. awesome yeah very should nice be fun. should be should be cool hopefully uh you know i haven't pieced everything together yet so the stuff you know maybe it doesn't go smoothly we'll see how the <laughs> video comes out but uh, it should be a beast of a system uh, you when know, that is live you know it can add yeah. for some frustrations during the build as you're trying to figure things out but it can also make for more interesting content especially when you include the things that go wrong and what you do to resolve them because there's going to be a lot of people out there who may be facing the same issues too despite yeah. you know the best planning best intentions sometimes things just don't line up right on the plus side most of the stuff is metal and you know with a sledgehammer and some pliers, <laughs> it makes stuff fit yes <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Well, a little little sawzall a little uh uh yeah. dremel yep and you know there's always duct tape if you if you can't fix it duck it um mm-hmm. yeah there's that so what do you think should we should we dive in on some of the microsoft stuff we're going to use a slightly different format this time um we are, we, we will recap some of the goings on at hot hardware at the end we figure everybody wants to get the main topic up front so if you came here based on the headline that's what you hear first so we're going to try that this time around um, if yeah. you guys like it let us know in the chat please comment and if you're watching right now do us a favor like the video share it out if you're so inclined we're trying to build the channel so anything you can do to help us would be absolutely awesome we have a bunch of guys in the chat already. Brian's here. Paul's here. Hopefully it builds as uh, as Chris and I chat here. Oh, yeah. And, and speaking of tweaking things around for a better experience, if anyone has like a better intro countdown video or something they want to make custom for us that we could use, uh, that'd be cool too. Yeah, if you look close, we have some products that might be over a decade old in that uh, in that little teaser. Oh, but, well, know, that one too. I, I was talking about the <laughs> countdown with the music before the stream comes live. Oh, gotcha, but yes, gotcha. also the splash. We're probably due for a refresh there as well. Yes, absolutely. Could definitely use an update. But yeah, getting to the goodness today, Microsoft launched a ton of stuff. If you weren't paying attention, they held their Surface event this morning. I think it kicked off at 11 a.m. Eastern. And Microsoft launched a absolutely a ton of products, right? So there was the Surface Pro 8, Surface Pro 7 Plus, Surface Laptop Studio, Surface Duo 2, Surface Go 3, an updated Surface Pro X, and some accessories like a new, um, the Surface Slim Pen 2, the Surface Adaptive Kit, which that little part of the presentation kind of hit me a little bit. We'll get to that later. A really interesting ocean plastic mouse, 
and a USB-C certified headset. So I think we'll kick things off with the Surface Pro 8, if that's cool with you, Chris. Is that mm -hmm. cool? So Surface Pro 8 is, you know, a finally an updated design. It's more akin to the Surface Pro X. Um, it's got a 13 inch display up from 12.3 inches with slimmer bezels. So the overall size of the device isn't much bigger, but you do get a bigger display. No more USB-A ports. It gets Thunderbolt 4. Um, it is built around Intel's Evo platform. Mm -hmm. You know, so newer hardware inside, newer screen, op obviously much higher performance. I, I haven't seen word yet on battery life. And it looks like configurations ranging from Core i5 8 gig all the way up to Core i7 with 32 gigs. And I believe up to one terabyte of NVMe storage. So lots of new stuff there. You know, my gut on the Surface Pro design, like I was thinking about it earlier. To me, I feel like the standalone tablet idea is kind of dead. Um, I am way more inclined to go with a convertible or a clamshell design over a tablet with a detachable keyboard, mm -hmm. at least for my particular use cases and what I like. But I'm not sure if I'm being too cynical. And what what, what well, do you think, Chris? Well, I think it uh, always comes back to how you're going to use the device. If you're mostly using it to browse the web, consume content, do the odd email here and there, I think a tablet can absolutely be great for that, especially if you want to maybe dabble in a little bit of digital artwork or something where you might be using a pen and stylus, pen stylus situation. Um, you know, the it's it's very light. It should travel pretty well. I mean, yeah, there's going to be the airplane situation where you're trying to put it upright and it won't f quite sit up on the tray. You know, there's always that drawback. But, you know, if you just want to throw it in a backpack and go on a day trip or something and have it with you, should be nice and convenient. Um, I would think it would be an excellent form factor for things like photo editing, where, you know, maybe you're not going to be using the pen all the time, but it could help to have it a little bit, but a lot of it's just kind of moving some dials and stuff, things like that. Um, very interesting. Yeah, they're giving up the, the type A ports it had, but, you know, you look at full on ultra books, full on laptop form factors that have also abandoned the type A format and gone straight to the type C with, you know, in this case, having Thunderbolt four, that's awesome if you need to have some fast storage. So, you know, I could, I could see this being used on like video shoots. Um, and when you're dumping footage, taking advantage of that very fast interface over the Thunderbolt four to offload, you know, 4k footage, um, or even access it live on a external SSD, um, could be very, very handy. So I think, I think there is a lot of potential there, even if it's not necessarily going to be the form factor you want for working on spreadsheets or, you know, data crunching kind of things. Um, it's, it's definitely going to have a market out there. And I think especially the way this one looks, it looks like, is that a 16 by 10 aspect ratio? Yeah, I believe so. 2880 by 1920 res, um, 120 okay. hertz, 120 so hertz. About, today, so yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I like that taller aspect ratio, especially with a lot of tasks that are well suited to this. The smaller bezels on the side are just making it feel like you have a larger screen, um, which I guess it is slightly, but you know, the, the perceptions there. So I, I like what I see with it. I'd like to get one in hand and actually play with it. Um, I did see up here, it looks like they're suggesting about 16 hours of battery life, yeah. um, which should hopefully get you through a work day. Obviously you need to test that in real world conditions and with your workload and see how it does for you. But, you know, we we're seeing a lot of ultra books get up in that performance, you know, that kind of battery lifespan right now anyway. So I don't see much reason to doubt that. Yeah, I have a feeling, you know, with with an OLED display and all the optim, you know, diving into 11th gen now when Intel's had lots of time to optimize and I'm sure Microsoft has been tweaking and, uh, you know, tuning the dials with Windows 11. You know, we should definitely talk about Windows 11 because that's another key component of all of these Surface mm -hmm. devices, except for the Duo 2. Yeah, you know, I, I, I look at this at the Surface Pro design and I loved it back in the day. And I have access to a couple of older ones. I think I have a Surface Pro 4 here that I still have around. And I have a Surface Pro X that I've, I've had since, uh, since the review. And I just don't turn to them unless it's for a project. You know, like if I'm doing work, mm -hmm. I, I, maybe it's just I'm an old curmudgeon. I, I just prefer the rigid clamshell design and I never use the pen. 
as much as you know, when, when I was traveling and attending events, I'm still somewhat of an old school guy. I do like to take notes sometimes on just with pen and paper and using the pen on a, on a tablet in theory would work great for me, but I just never found myself finding my groove. So this one, they, turning to it. with the pen here, they've incorporated some haptic feedback, right? To try yeah. and better simulate the, the writing on paper experience. Um, again, another reason to get it in hand and, and definitely try it. But I'm going to derail our conversation for a moment and put okay. up Ben's comment here about ha having <laughs> to call his phone company six times to pay his bills. So he posted this in the Discord asking what to do. And at the time, I said, you know, I you're mark the money in your account, whatever, and, and see if they surprise double bill you at some point. Anyways, after I post that message, I close Discord, I open my email and find the Lowe's email that they've notified me that they've charged me the whole balance of my account. So Ben, I think it's I think it's your fault. I think it's your fault that I'm facing my billing issues. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> he put that vibe out into the universe. The secret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, entirely possible. <laughs> um, anyways, join the Discord if you haven't already. I'll try and find a link at some point. But um, yeah, do you want to move on to the duo, or do you have more thoughts on the? Yeah, no, I think you know if everyone's familiar with the Pro Eight. We can probably move on. Just to quickly uh, re reiterate, um, well, just to mention. Most of these devices, I think actually all of them, shipping October 5th, Surface Pro 8 prices starting at 1099 for the entry-level model, top-end model is 2600 bucks, 2599 with a Core i7 and 32 gigs. So um, yeah, interesting. And just also to reiterate, the, the pen with the new haptics, there is also a premium keyboard cover with a new like dock to charge it as well coming. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of cool. Like it, it is... It seems more refined than the previous one, so I definitely agree. I should. I, I want to play with it before I draw an opinion. I just yeah. that that floppy kickstand, as cool as it was when it launched, uh, I just it, it never yeah. stuck with me. And, and the pricing is often hard to swallow. I mean, electronics seem to have just gone up and up in price in general, but the surfaces are always pretty premium priced. I mean, they're premium devices. I get it. Um, but you know, when you're looking at this versus an ultrabook, and yeah, when you're kitted out to twenty five ninety nine, that's a, a lot of money for a device that's not really running a discrete GPU, or you know, it's yeah. you know, how much performance functionality are you getting out of it? I guess for for the price is is tough to balance. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. So let's move on. You know, I'll quickly mention, we don't have to talk about this one, but uh, they Microsoft snuck out a Surface Pro 7 Plus for business. Um, essentially, similar design to Surface Pro 7, but based on Intel 11th gen processors. So if you want that USB-A port and have accessories for an existing Surface Pro, but, you know, have a fleet, maybe you want to upgrade, those are coming too. But let's move on. So this, this device, I think, is the really cool one. This The laptop, the Surface Laptop Studio, this one's really interesting. So Surface Laptop Studio is based on 11th gen core H35 processors. So the higher end uh, Tiger Lake H processors in the 35 watt TDP. The top end options will have up to a GeForce RTX 3050 graphics. These guys are 14.4 inch displays, resolution 2400 by 1600, also 120 hertz. Um, you know, Thunderbolt 4, all of the latest accessories and connectivity you'd expect from Intel's 11th gen core platform. But it's the form factor that's interesting here. So it looks like a clamshell, right? But it's sort of like a combo clamshell folio because you can pull that screen forward, you know, to enable a different, a different, you know, view mode or fold it all the way flat, right? Mm -hmm. Like a, like it's how this guy I would really love to get my hands on because you're talking monster performance with Intel's top end platform with a gorgeous screen and this more interesting form factor, at least to me. Uh, this mm -hmm. one, I think, is the winner for today. What, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, I think this form factor is really fascinating because when you look at the the laptops with a 360 hinge that, you know, they can get similar to this where they're flat. But on the backside, the keyboard's exposed. So some models will have a thing where there's a little section that comes up and kind of makes it more flush with the keyboard, prevents the keys from pressing. Um, even if it doesn't do that, they'll disable the keys, but it always just feels off to me. Um, so being able to literally slide down the display as this one does, um, 
it's just a, it seems like it would be more comfortable to use and i like that you can put it at an angle and bring it closer um it, i'd be very intrigued to see how that is as of course as long as the hinge is sturdy enough but i have no reason to believe it wouldn't be the the surfaces that have had that kind of hinge style without the keyboard at the bottom have been plenty sturdy um yeah. in my experience though usually they have a pop out function if they overextend so i'm not quite sure how this would handle that i don't know if they said anything um about it detaching um but yeah, i don't think I th so I think being able to put it in an incline, especially if you have more customizability than just that in-between position, um, if you want something a, a little more slanted to draw on for some digital art or something like that, um, very intriguing. See, I think this one, the, the the this one addresses all of the issues for me with the kickstand, right? You basically get 90% of the tablet functionality and the different modes, you know, but mm -hmm. with with that more rigid clamshell, you know, we have some, oh, you, you pop the comments up on the screen. You know, it seems like a bunch of the guys in the chat are also interested in this one. Definitely has more, more appeal, I agree. You know, and Paul also mentions big improvement over my Surface Book. As cool as the Surface Book was, you know, that weird hinge, I never liked that spacing and that curved hinge. So, yeah, I totally agree. This design is way more interesting. I think it has way more appeal performance should kick should kick ass you know up to two terabytes of storage rtx 3050 up to core i7 with 32 gigs so mm -hmm. really strong performance potentially you know a decent gamer for 1080p gaming you know lots of lots of intriguing possibilities with this guy now pricing is going to be the kicker um 1600 bucks starting and right. it was 30 3100 bucks with the 32 gig core i7 and rtx 3050 with two terabytes of storage so not completely out of the realm for premium. No, I mean, it, devices, a few but... hundred dollars premium over a premium regular laptop, like a Dell XPS or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're going to take advantage of the form factor and the versatility of it, I think that's yeah, really much, good. much so... more palatable than, uh, than, you know, the $2,600 tablet. Yeah, for sure. So we have we have Ben saying, you know, he's uh, really worried about the screen being scratched. You know, I've never had an issue. I, I used to be one of those guys that always put screen protectors on and, you know, was nuts about trying to protect my screens on phones and, and tablets. And I've never actually scratched one. So it's like I stopped, oh, I have. I stopped putting screen protectors on. I've put some I, I, pretty good gouges in displays. Um, yeah, I've, yeah, yeah I've but you more. break everything. You break literally I, everything. I, I do break everything. I am a QA <laughs> tester's worst nightmare. It's like uh, as soon as stuff enters Chris's lab, it, it's afraid and it, they break down. And I'm not even joking. <laughs> no, I've had to send back more products than I'm proud of to get replaced for reviews. Yeah, um, so we, we have Paul Diddy asking, oh, wait, I cl sorry, I clicked the wrong one. We had Paul asking, you know, why do they keep selling the pen separately? So yeah, you know, it doesn't make sense to me either, right? I think Apple the keyboard did it. And, exactly. Like they're just milking consumers for extra money, in my opinion. It is what it is. We don't have to pull any punches. You know, to, to add, to have to pay extra for a keyboard and pen, I mean, those, those are the main appeals. Just mm -hmm. throw them in there. Just, just, just do it. Just throw it in there, kick the price up, you know, X amount and make it easy for everybody. You know, if you know, what would stink is going to a Best Buy with your heart set on the keyboard, pen and device, and you get there and they only have the device or they only have the keyboard or they're out of the pen. Like just, mm -hmm. just bundle it, keep it all together. All I, right. I, well, I fully it's... agree. Like if you try to buy, a, say, a Canon mirrorless camera right now, and they have that adapter that's really just a ring with some electric contacts to use your old EF glass from the DSLRs on it, it's a hundred bucks for it, whatever. But it's literally basically not in stock anywhere. So if you have all this lens collection and you go to buy your nice new camera with the new mirrorless technology, and you have lenses that technically could work with it, but you can't buy the adapter to make them work. Um, it, it's just included in the box. People are going to use it. Yep. So I'm just going to pop this on the screen quickly. I'm I'm not going to try even to pronounce your name. Uh, Itachi, maybe that's correct. Really, the only difference with the Surface Go 3 is the, plat the processors inside. You The top end model 
It's going to have a 10th gen Core i3. Um, but if you go look at Surface Go 2 reviews in terms of form factor and, and connectivity, it's going to be the same. But we're going to talk about that in a bit. We're still we're still going to talk about a few other products before we get to the Surface Go. Um, any other things you think we should mention on the, the, the laptop studio or should we move on? Um, oh, I, I don't think we've really pointed out that they're running 120 hertz displays on both this and the, mm -hmm. the tablet, um, which yeah. is nice to just kind of, it's nice to be at a point where they can throw that in there and it's not a headlining feature. It's just kind of, oh yeah, it has that too. It's really appreciated, and I think it's taking advantage of Windows 11 dynamic refresh rate as well. So it can run at 60 hertz for most of the time, but when you're going to do something like interacting with the pen or touch or something like that, that you would want the smoothness, it'll ramp up to the 120 hertz and give you that smoother experience without completely draining your battery life all the time. Or Yeah, absolutely. So the theory goes. It, it, you know, absolutely, and I think lots of people... I'm sure not, you know, the hardcore guys in our chat that understand all of this, but lots of people misunderstand, you know, screen refresh. They think it's really only for gaming and it's absolutely not. I mean, it just everything is smoother with the high refresh mm -hmm. display, mouse movements. And it goes again, goes back to the pen, having better haptics in the pen and a, you know, lower latency input with a higher refresh display just improves that whole experience. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, d definitely worth uh, pointing out those 120 hertz screens. It's a, a very yeah. welcome improvement. Yeah, I, I just like seeing that, and I, I and I like seeing that it's not being like shouted from the mountaintop. It's just there. It's good. We're moving yeah. in the right direction. And even absolutely. if you don't think you can see 120 frames, it, that's not the point. Is you absolutely can feel it. Um, I've got a 144 hertz screen in front of me, and I have a 60 hertz screen to the left, and you can perceive the difference between the two. Um, mm -hmm. It's there. Absolutely. It just feels nicer. Just, just to, you know, just to show how old I am. I, and I, I haven't been able to find this freaking demo for years, but way back when 3d effects launched, I think this was for the voodoo one, or maybe it was the voodoo two. They had a demo that showed, um, I believe it was uh, 30 FPS, 60 FPS, 90 FPS, and maybe that was it. I don't remember. It's been so long. But, you know, everybody, oh, you can't see faster than 60 FPS. BS. Most mm -hmm. people can totally see more than 60 frames per second. Um, right. And it's and even if it's tough to make out, you know, looking at a, at a display and saying, oh, this one's running faster than 60, you can totally feel it with mouse movements and everything. So I think Ben is, I think that demo was 30, 60, 90. I think he's right. I just haven't seen it in so many years. Yeah. Yeah. The other nice thing about 120 hertz is if you're watching 24 FPS video, which a lot of filmmakers in particular or movies are shot in, um, you don't get the weird 3-2 pull down where the frames are slightly stuttered because it's trying to match 60 hertz. At 120, it's it's playing all frames for the same duration. So it really helps with the judder as well. Nice. Very cool. Oh, Ben, ben is showing out... Uh... Uh -huh. was in review business in 1996. Yeah, man. I think that was just before me. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So let's move on to the Surface Duo 2 because I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for my opinion on this one. So Surface Duo 2, uh, Microsoft's new um, foldable you know, flagship Android device. This guy's not running Windows 11. Um, so basically everything updated over the original. It's a, a more durable hinge design, uh, newer displays, which total about 8.3 inches diagonal with the cool waterfall effect in the middle so that when the device is folded, you have, you know, visible areas on the screen for notifications and, you know, battery life information, stuff like that. Um, really, you know, top end Snapdragon 888 mobile platform. So now 5G in here. Um, updated triple camera setup and two of the cameras have optical image stabilization. So very cool. No, you know, marketing BS with resolutions and megapixels, you know, 16 megapixel, uh, 12 megapixel and 12 megapixel on the, on the three shooters. So should be interesting camera array, big upgrade over the previous one. But I look at it and I'm, I'm going to grab this because it's not charged, but I've had this here for a while. This is the, the, the LG G8 X thin thin Q with the dis the extra display case, mm -hmm. and you know like this kind of tech has been here. They're, the only new trail Microsoft is blazing is 
kind of having both displays built in and not on a case. And I don't know, like the Android experience just wasn't awesome with multiple screens for me, at least the last I tried it. So mm -hmm. I look at this device and, you know, they're starting at 1500 bucks for eight gigs and 128 gigs of storage. So you're talking, you know, it's an 888. So it is flagship performance for Android. But in terms of memory and storage, nowhere near some of the top end devices that are out there. And 1800 bucks for eight gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. So I don't know. I think you, 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 you couple the maybe not ideal multi-screen experience with Android with a kind of relatively large design with, you know, the split down the hinge, down the middle. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know if I would enjoy this device at those prices. So the experience it's going to provide, you know, yeah. I mean, I can absolutely see the reason behind wanting a dual width screen, especially if you're doing productivity stuff, writing emails, taking notes, et cetera, at the same time. Um, I don't think I'm as bothered by the seam down the middle because if I were to use a device like that, that has the book fold to it, um, whether it's the Samsung or this, I don't really want it to act as one screen on a mobile device at that point. I, I, I wouldn't think I, I want that separation. So having the bezel there or not doesn't really, I think matter to me. Um, so, you know, it's whatever there, but what, what, what you're stuck with, with this and the, and the galaxy fold versus what you have with the LG G eight X is the G G the G eight X. You can pop out the phone and just use one when you want and pop it in when you need it to get the multiple displays, like just talking purely form factor, regardless of how Android functions with multiple screens. Um, we're here, you, and with the fold, you've got the the bulk kind of all the time um, when you, you know, maybe don't need it 95, 98% of the time, depending on what you do. Um, and I think if you are the kind of person who, again, is using the larger screen that much, you're probably someone who's going to be picking up a tablet anyway. So it, it, it's just... I, that particular the book fold form factor I don't quite understand the the more like the flip or the Motorola did with their razor razor refresh um, with the you know the the folding the other way taking a normal size phone and just folding it down in half I think makes more sense to me in general because it can let you maybe pocket it easier or put it in a purse whatever however you carry um, yeah I I mean. You know, There's so interesting we, things you can do with this, but it, do I want that as my daily driver? And I, I just, I don't see it. Yeah. Like I, I, I totally agree with you. Like if to me, they should have put windows 11 on it. I mean, it's got mm -hmm. the, you know, probably similar performance to a surface pro X. Um, you know, we, we have been asking, you know, you know, question, is this a tablet? Like not really. Cause you have the seam down the middle. So it's like, just two phones stuck together, <laughs> you know, right. not really like a single screen tablet. So I, I, it's, it's a cool, it's a cool thought, but for Android, you're probably better off with a single larger screen, like a fold. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you just don't want that massive, well, you know, it's not really massive. I shouldn't say that that's not fair, but if you, if you don't want that larger format, just a regular phone is, you know, going to offer the same performance and everything. You just don't have the dual screen form factors and, and the use cases that that enables. So, yeah, I will say about the, the, the G8X Thin Q, taking the phone out of this case, it's a little a little bit of a pain. Like, it comes out easy enough. But then, mm -hmm. like, what do you do with this? You're going to leave this home? Like, I don't think most people, I think most people yeah. would carry it one way or the other. So I, this is still an area that needs evolution in my opinion, you know, All right. you know well, we just uh, have to break the laws of physics so we can just shrink things down smaller than they are when we don't need it and then stretch them out and get them when we go. do. We need pin particles for our devices, you know, right. make them bigger, smaller. That would, that would be phenomenal. But yeah, so I don't know. I might, I think Microsoft's got a, uh, got some work to do to sell this guy. Now, if just going back, if it had windows 11, right, which would work well with two screens, Mm-hmm and a cool physical keyboard accessory, now you can ditch your laptop, right? 
you can if you literally if you live in email and word uh, when you're working well, see, most of the time that's interesting to me see then you're appealing to a lot of kids who want to play roblox in class and so they'll be gaming on their phone that's a lot. in the back yeah, of the yeah. class yeah I learned hey, you have your market playing, that way. Yeah, I learned more playing on my computers than I ever did in school. <laughs> it's it gaming is the best teacher of typing, at least, you know, in the days before voice chat, because if you couldn't type fast and accurately, your team was going to die. Absolutely. And so exactly. it just like necessitated becoming a better typer. Amen. You know, maybe form was out the windows or typing with one hand or whatever, but you know, you get there. Why are you typing with one hand first? No, I'm just kidding. Because the other um, is Amy. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. My mind was in the gutter for a second. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. <laughs> gaming. Gaming. So unless anyone in the chat has uh, some questions they want to throw away, I think we're going to move on from this, the Duo 2. Um, you know, actually, wait, just I quickly should mention about the, the camera setup. Um, that's, I think the camera setup is going to be pretty cool on this phone. So mm -hmm. 16 megapixel, uh, F22, uh, ultra wide, 12 megapixel F17 with OIS wide angle and a 12 megapixel F2.4 telephoto. Um, I loved the photos from my windows phones. So like Microsoft, I think doesn't go too nuts with the image processing and does good work there. So I have a feeling the cameras are probably going to be nicer than expected on here. It's mm -hmm. just the form factors. You know, we have we have been saying, you know, with about my keyboard comments, when you add this to a keyboard, it quickly doesn't save space. It doesn't save space over a phone, but it certainly would save space over having to take a laptop or, you know, a Surface Pro with you. You know, if you don't need the keyboard, you know, Bluetooth keyboard that folds up like the size of a, of a Samsung Flip. Mm -hmm. I've used those in the past on tablets. And then, you know, you have your phone, you have everything with you with the full Windows experience on a dual screen setup. And if you need the keyboard, you have it, you know, without having to have a, you know, a whole laptop back. I guess, you. would you want a keyboard that attaches to it necessarily, or just a Bluetooth keyboard that is no. small that you could have more freedom of positioning with? For me personally, the, uh, the Bluetooth keyboard um, would be better. Something wireless, you know, and you know, we have Oscar, Oscar is absolutely right. You know, don't call it a phone. Microsoft doesn't like that. It's not really a phone, you know, it's a productivity device with phone functionality built in. And yeah. because you're going to be carrying it around, they're incorporating all of the features we'd expect from a phone. Everyone wants to be able to take pictures and to shoot video and, you know, all, all that kind of good stuff. But I mean, it, there's inevitably going to be compared to devices like the Fold and it's running Android. So it's going to be compared to smartphones running Android. It is what it is. But yeah, this one. Microsoft's got to do lots of selling on yeah. this device. In my I opinion. mean, I guess to that point, why do we even call smartphones phones when the phone function is probably the least used function on most of our so-called phones? But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Yeah, that's it. We can do a whole <laughs> podcast on that discussion, probably. So let's let's move on. Let's let's jump just quickly, because this one, there's not much to talk about uh, on the, the Surface Go 3. We should probably cover this next. So Surface Go 3, essentially the same form factor as the Go 2. This is the mainstream tablet. Price is starting at $399 for devices with a Pentium processor and 4 gigs on up to $630 for the top-end Core i3 with 8 gig. We should mention that's a 10th gen Core i3, not 11th gen. So same form factor, 10.5-inch screen, 1920 by 1280 res. Um, just, yeah, just a faster platform inside. Um, this mm -hmm. one, I'm not so sure. The price is right. You know, when I was when I was traveling pre-COVID, you know, going to events, I still was carrying an original Surface just for movie consumption with my XPS 13. So, you know, if I had an empty tray table next to me, pop the Surface over there just to play my movies while I'm working on the XPS 13. So I get the appeal of this guy. But if I'm going for this sort of mostly consumption type device that should be based on a on, a, on an ARM based chip, you know. In my opinion, I don't know. Yeah, do think? yeah, I can see that because you know you're probably going to get better efficiency and battery life out of the ARM chip. It's, it, I mean, it's made to run, uh, you know, more efficiently on battery and such. So, yep. I yeah. guess you're not really going to be wanting to use it for many demanding tasks anyway. So, it may be wasted horsepower with the full Intel chip. 
Yeah, I mean, it would. It's on one hand, it would be nice to have you know that full x86 functionality with no worries about what you're going to run on it. You know, although Windows 11 sort of changes that paradigm too. But yeah, so just unless there's any specific questions from anyone in the chat, this guy fairly straightforward, just new processor platform in, in the Go 3. Um, I think we can probably have some more interesting discussion on the surface, the new Surface Pro X, which isn't really new, but when it's paired to Windows 11, that's where things get interesting. So there was an updated Surface Pro X also announced today. Um, it's essentially the same as the existing Surface Pro X minus the built-in LTE. So it's a Wi-Fi only model, um, still the same 13 inch, same resolution as the Pro 8 on the screen, does not get 120 Hertz display, um, but it's now starting at 899. So What's interesting, I, I have the Surface Pro X here. This is the form factor. This one, um, ha, let me just log in and make sure there's no reflection so you guys can't see my pin here. But um, yeah. good. so Windows 11, I did install Windows 11 on this guy. And interesting, interestingly enough, even in beta, it's about 10% faster. So if you saw as Surface Pro X reviews when they came out, and you compare it now to the beta of, of Windows 11 running on it, it's about 10% faster in the handful of benchmarks I ran. I haven't tested battery life yet. Um, it feels snappier for sure. The Edge Chromium-based browser, way more refined than it was when it launched. Um, mm -hmm. So the experience on this ARM-based device is significantly better than when it launched today. I had I literally just wiped it and did Windows 11 like a couple of days ago. So I haven't gone all in and installed the apps that I would use daily to see how it behaves with 64 bit app uh, emulation. So I don't know if, if, if people in the chat are not familiar. Windows 10 on ARM still doesn't have or maybe it launched. I might get this wrong, but it has it hadn't had 64 bit emulation for a long time. It was out in beta for a while. I'm not sure if it's fully integrated yet. It might be. But that was a big drawback. If you went to run a 64-bit x86 app under emulation, you couldn't do it. So mm -hmm. some stuff seemed to install, and then you couldn't run it. It was just a pain. And I believe with Windows 11, those pain points are going to be gone. So those app compatibility headaches potentially go away, and you get better performance. So this and, and technically, I mean, it's a lower price without the LTE at 8.99. We were having a chat before the podcast. I think it still should be cheaper. If these guys were six ninety nine, they'd mm -hmm. probably sell way better because battery life is phenomenal. But yeah, that's the Pro Eight. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the the new Surface Pro X. Uh, Chris, thoughts on this one? Yeah. Um. Well, like you just said, I think that seven hundred dollar price point is really the mass market sweet spot for particularly for a device like this, you just want something that's quality that works, but isn't too expensive. That's really what you want to target. I mean, who knows what their overhead costs and, and all that are on it. Um, but you know, it'll probably get to that price point soon enough. Um, I think it's certainly, a, an interesting, um, option in the stack. So, yeah, I'm, I, I would love, a a, a a studio laptop style design with a next gen you know higher end arm based platform assuming mm -hmm. the battery life characteristics carry over with more perf with no compatibility uh, issues it's going to be very compelling in my opinion i'm looking forward to when that happens i think that's going to happen as you see you know looking at all of these devices you know they're they're getting smaller slimmer more features that we'd see in a smartphone coming, you know, to tablets and Windows 11, way more smartphone integration. So yeah, the interesting stuff coming down the pipeline for sure. Yeah, and I, I had a Windows 11 question I was gonna ask you and I'm totally spacing on what it was. So I'm trying to think of it and I don't know, it'll either come back or it won't. So, you know, what we'll do, we're, let's talk about some of the accessories super, super fast and then we'll reiterate some of the stuff we talked to had on HH this week. So we already mentioned a couple of times the Surface Slim Pen 2 uh, announced today too. Basically just a, you know, a slimmer design, finer tip point, um, improved haptics with the new engine in there. This one does need mm -hmm. to be charged. It charges in the little dock in the keyboard. 
seems cool. You know, I, I didn't write down the price. I think what is it? it's like seventy nine bucks. Did you did you get a handle on that? Um, I didn't catch. I can go back and yeah, check. I, yeah, I didn't catch that. So yeah, not much to talk to on the pen. We we know what's involved with the pens. Um, I'm going to go to the Ocean Plastic Mouse next. Hmm. This one's cool. So you know, Microsoft is making a push for uh, sustainability and you know helping the environment. The Ocean Plastic Mouse uh, is made from a resin that's using 20% uh, recycled ocean plastics. Looks pretty cool. You know, it has a little bit of texture, so you know it's obviously they're they're advertising the fact that they're using recycled materials in the design. Mm -hmm. But kudos to Microsoft for that. What what, what do you think about that? Uh, so I, I do think that's an interesting step in the right direction. I mean, I one of my biggest pet peeves is electronic waste. I can't stand it. I mean, along with a lot of the packaging that, you know, it's gotten better in recent years, but particularly how products are packaged and there's just tons of waste that come with them, particularly the plastics wrapping everything. Love to see less and less of that. Incorporating that into the product itself, also cool. Um, you know, it'd be nice if we could get to a point where it was sustainable to actually recycle the electronic components themselves in a meaningful way. Um, yeah, you can go in and extract the the precious minerals and stuff to it, but that has its own kind of economic cost to it in other ways um, and environmental costs. So, you know, it's cool. I definitely like seeing that kind of thing. I'm not an eco hippie by any means, but anywhere we can cut down on pollution and waste, I'm more than happy to see. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have Paul in the chat. You, know, you didn't realize it was actually ocean plastics. Yeah, not only is it ocean plastics, but I believe, and I might get the details wrong on this, Microsoft also announced a program to recycle your old mice. So nice. if you get this and you, you know, you're replacing a mouse, I believe you can send them your existing mouse and uh, you know get that get the plastics recycled in that so that that's pretty cool i like that idea quickly i'm just going to mention you know the usb headset a usb c headset was also announced it's certified for microsoft teams microsoft claims really high quality uh, audio and voice it's a headset nothing to get terribly excited over unless chris you have anything you want to throw in on that um I mean, it, it, you got to listen to it and see how it sounds and how your voice picks up and everything else. I mean, I've used expensive headsets that sound like garbage and cheap headsets that sound pretty good. So <laughs> yep. um, until you get it on your head and use it, you don't really know. Yep. And then finally, I, I saved this one for last because it, uh, this actually hit me as, as a, uh, you know, a dad to a special needs kid. Microsoft announced the Surface Adaptive Kit. Now, really... It's it's I'm going to simplify and, and make it sound bad, but I really like this initiative. It's really just a bunch of stickers. So the the adaptive kit is to help, you know, low vision users uh, or users with limited strength. So it's like some stickers and a um, and a lanyard that you can attach to the kickstand on a mm -hmm. service device. So the stickers are meant to help you find the ports to label the ports with clear color coding and symbols and the lanyard attached to the kickstand. So if may, perhaps you don't have full functionality of your hands. Instead of trying to you know, cram your thumbnail behind the kickstand, you just grab the lanyard and pull. The Microsoft rep that was uh, involved in the video had cerebral palsy and he was telling a story how he'd have to use a fork to get the kickstand out on his old surface. So, you know, that segment. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Like it really got to me. I just wish Microsoft just went all in on this. Now, I know it would, it would add cost, but how about putting, you know, little lights or colored LEDs next to ports and match them to the power cord or just build in a little hook to the mm -hmm. kickstand doesn't have to be huge and everyone's everyone's phone now has these pop out you know handles on the back for holding just go all in or even make a device you know that's specially devised for more inclusivity like this i i love that they did it i'm really i'm i don't want to put this down at all because yeah. i love the fact that they brought this front and center well, and but you know, we're we're definitely in an era where everything's that very clean, industrial, minimalist design. Half the ports don't even have labels anymore, um, depending on the, the device you have. But you can still have smartly incorporated colors and even logos and stuff and still keep that industrial design. And it's, it is a shame to see it going away. And also, too, even for people who don't necessarily need the accessibility aspects, being able to look at a type C port and know whether it's just USB, if it's Thunderbolt three, if it's Thunderbolt four is also important to just know what to expect to get out of the port. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like, you know, with Microsoft in particular, we've seen over the years them doing different things to incorporate accessibility in different ways. I feel like there was a lot they were doing, especially with the Connect era, um, just to enable different ways of interacting with devices and 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 making custom controllers for people with different um, limb functions and and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So again, I like to see that. It's a very positive thing. Yeah, this is very, very cool stuff. You know, and, and with that, I mean, that was everything from the Microsoft event. Um, we're going to recap a couple of quick things from HH, but if you guys have any any questions in the chat, go ahead and feel free to throw them in. We'll interrupt whatever else we're talking about and jump back and get to them. Um, before we sign off, though, um, just some of the cool headlines from the past week. Um, I think let's start with the, um, with the Alder Lake headline, Chris. So this one, I hope, I hope this is true. A, there was a leaked Cinebench score from an Alder Lake based Core i9 uh, 12900K that showed it crushing the 5950X. So, a multi threaded score of 30,549, you know, versus about 26K for a 5950. That's, that's beefy. That's yeah. a beefy score um, from, you know, technically eight high powered cord cores and eight low power cores versus 16 high powered cores from amd if this test is true i'm getting pretty excited for alder lake yeah <laughs> well, I, i'd be I, i'm very curious to know exactly how the the division and score contribution kicks in there um you know if it's like two-thirds of the performance is coming from the big cores and one-third from the small cores or how exactly that breaks down and i don't know if i guess within cinebench if there's a great way to suss out those intricacies i don't know if you could maybe set limiting the cores to just eight and hoping that it latches on to the big cores to test and figure out the performance delta there or something else. Um, but yeah, even with the big cores and small cores, putting up those bigger numbers, if true, because um, mm. again, you, you know, you can fake screenshots. It yeah. wouldn't be that hard, but it's very, very promising at the very least. Yeah. Um, we, we're not going to spend a ton of time on it, but yeah, I'm with you. Like this one, this one is, is intriguing. I, I'm, I'm hoping it's in that ballpark because that's some killer performance. Um, before we move on to the next headline, you know, Ben wants to ask a question about, you know, what about the alleged continuing in increase in GPU prices despite the flooding of crypto cards in the market? I think that unfortunately, with all of the supply chain supply chain shortages and everything that's happened to all of the materials in GPUs over and above the, you know, the the traditional stuff used to make the chips everything's gotten more expensive. So if you look at MSRPs, I'm going to use RTX 30 series as an example. You can't find any RTX 30 series cards at or near MSRP. And everyone assumes it's just because of the shortages. shortages. And yes, that is a huge contributor. But I don't think NVIDIA could make them and have the profit margins they would like with the higher cost of all of the raw materials as of today. I, I hope along with everyone else that changes, but I'm not sure. Chris, and, did I just cut you off? Were you going to jump in? Oh, uh, I was just going to say, and not just the raw material cost, but also the transportation, the packaging, as we've discussed before, like every part of it. And it's, it's more than just the chip. It's more than just the card. Um, everything's just so expensive and hard to come by right now. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, I've floated it out there. Maybe the, card manufacturers and and developers should just be more upfront with their you know pricing to begin with and raise msrps and at least be honest about it um yeah. and maybe discourage scalpers at the same time by shifting more money to the manufacturers in the first place to reinvest in in the market um not going to pretend to have any magic solutions when everything every supply chain is such a mess um yeah but yeah yeah, I mean, I think AMD took some flack for the 6600 XT pricing when in reality they were making an attempt to reflect the new reality of raw material pricing. Right. May maybe. They didn't really specifically come out and say that, but, you know, it, and it is I would, what it is right now. I would suspect that there's also some political pressure on these companies that realistically want to and need to raise their prices but have to maintain the performance, the appearance of keeping inflation under control. 
Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I wouldn't be shocked if there's some backroom uh, discussions going on there as well. You know, and the wild card is uh, don't forget Intel entering the, the space in a few mm -hmm. months. And if the shortages start to ease up and there's now a viable third competitor, things could get interesting. So, yeah. So this is a fun segue, <laughs> fun segue into our next uh, topic. Yeah, next topic. So we have uh, rumors of the uh, RTX 30 series super cards. Um, I, I, you know, I was looking at this leak from a, you know, a Twitter user claiming the 3090 Super is going to have 10,752 uh, processors, the 3080 Super uh, 8960, the 3070 Super uh, 5,888, and the 3060 Super uh, 5,632. And if you look at those core counts, they kind of line up right where you'd expect. Memory configurations up to 24 gigs, 12 gig for the 3080, which I think makes sense to go to 12 gig. The 3070 and 3060 still have that weird dynamic where the higher end card has less memory. I'm not sure that's going to be true. Maybe because it's GDDR6X. Yeah. I don't know. That's like a marketing I, confusing thing. I would think NVIDIA is going to address that. But what, what do you think, Chris? I mean, bandwidth is certainly important, but also at this point, just texture sizes and everything else that can actually use that VRAM capacity. I, I feel like, you know, eight gigabytes is pretty tight on a card of what I would expect the performance class of a 3070 Super to be. Um, I would hope that they put at least 12 gigs, if not, you know, I'd like to see 16 gigs or more in the 3080 Super myself. Um, so it's just, again, you know, it, it, it's, it's a leak. It's a possibly speculation, someone's best guess. I don't know. I, I'd like to see better. Yeah, tomorrow somebody will change the memory configs and say they have a new leak and we'll, we'll post that. Right. But yeah, that, that one's that. Um, and then finally, some potentially good news. Um, Trendforce is a, a you know a, a marketing a, analyst firm, I'm sorry, a, a technology analyst firm, and they are claiming that most of the top DRAM providers hit peak capacity in Q or are going to hit peak capacity in Q3, and DRAM prices are going to fall. Um, a, a glimmer of hope for people that want to build new PCs or are looking to upgrade, what have you. You know, DRAM is uh, very important for essentially every aspect of uh, you know every component in a pc so yeah you know hoping to uh hoping this comes true and that you can get a bunch of memory cheap yeah i think uh, they were already noting memory prices have come down from last year a little bit um yeah. and they're projecting maybe what was it another 10 percent price drop so nothing too hugely dramatic but definitely welcome yeah, I think 10% just next quarter and potentially okay. more later. So yeah, I mean, it's good stuff. Anything to bring the price of entry to, you know, getting into a PC down, I'm all for. Um, I'm still, you know, the PC is the premier platform for like basically everything for content creation, for gaming, for getting work done. It's the mm -hmm. PC. So yeah, right, I but, hope this is but true. But don't forget, this doesn't extend to just the PC. This is everything mm -hmm. that's using memory is going to be sure. affected by this. So you know, your phones and tablets and other smart devices you have, they they all need memory. Um, yep. So I'm going to just pop some fun comments in here. You know, Ben saying uh, his first VGA card was a one meg Trident. I don't remember my first card, but I remember the first card I lusted after was a Diamond Speedstar. <laughs> think it was a 16-bit isa card or was it the speed yeah i think the speed star was one it was a long freaking time ago man. <laughs> Ugh, sucks i'm getting old and then we have you know uh, oscar castillo um will arc have anything like resizable bar support i believe um intel has disclosed yes um yeah maybe I, they have I, it, but I, it just makes sense that they're going to support it yeah it's kind of unavoidable at this point i think that i guess the mm -hmm. resizable bar revolution is here and there's no reason not to integrate that. Yeah, I mean, the resizable bar is a, a PCIe, you know, it's, it's part of the PCIe spec. So, you know, now that it's been exposed and AMD and NVIDIA are using it, I, I, I if Intel hasn't already disclosed it, I would bet the farm that they are going to for sure. Yep. We, we have Raymond yeah. saying time to buy another 32 gigs. You can never have too much memory, my brother. That's for sure. Um, and I think that's about it. You know, Benjamin, it would be nice if GPU RAM prices would lower GPU prices. That's a possibility. Yeah, we'll see. Uh -huh. So good stuff. 
And with that, Chris, unless you have something else to add, I think uh, I think it's probably time to wrap it up. What do you think? Um, I think we're about there. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So I want to thank everybody uh, for hanging out with us for the last, you know, almost an hour. We really appreciate you hanging out with us. If you haven't already done so, please like the video, please share, please comment even after the video goes live. It helps the algorithm. You'll be doing us a great favor. If you don't already subscribe to the channel, please do that. That would also help us as well. We're thinking about starting some other channels to separate some other content. Well, maybe we talk about that on another podcast to get all of your input. For now, you know, you can find us everywhere. Obviously, hothardware.com. There's tons of content on the site that we do not mention during the cast. We can stay on for hours if we talked about everything that gets posted on the site. So please stop by hothardware.com. You can also find us on facebook.com slash hothardware, twitter.com slash hothardware. We're on Instagram. Don't forget our Patreon. That would be a great way to support us if you're so inclined. Every little bit helps keep an independent publisher online. Very important to us to remain independent. Um, our Patreon is live for a little while. Go check that out. And if you have ideas for cool perks for different levels on the Patreon, we're all ears. Um, if there's anything that you guys think would make any part of the site or our channels better, we definitely want to know about it. And with that, I think we will bid you adieu. Thank you so much for hanging out with us.